So last night you should have read the last little bit of this fleeting world that we're going to bother with, and that's pages 52 to 57. So go ahead again, as usual, uh, label your notes, this fleeting world pages 52 to 57. And what we're doing here with this section, again, it won't take us very long to go over. It's just kind of getting us up to pretty much where we take over in the textbook. Um, so we're looking at the creation of global networks, and this era is going to go from about 1000 to 1750, give or take, you know, obviously a couple days. Um, the most important change during this time period was a unification of the major world zones during the 16th century. Guys, remember this century is always one more than the hundreds, so 16th century is the 1500s. And remember, when we started this fleeting world, we talked about the isolation of all of the world zones, that they don't have any contact with each other until the 1500s, until the 16th century. I mean, technically, we don't start this until 1492, like I told you before, when Columbus goes off. What this is going to do here, starting in the 15th century, and again, we'll talk about this more when we get to the textbook, is this is going to create the first global network of exchange. And this is going to be, again, one of those themes that we will deal with the entire year. Not only creating those global networks of exchange that will start in the 16th century and will kind of build from there, but we're also going to be tightening those networks uh, as well. With Afro-Eurasia, the most striking feature of this period was the increasing scale of intensity of international contacts. It's the Afro-Eurasian world zone that is going to be responsible for tying these other world zones together. They're going to be the ones that go to the Americas. They're going to be the ones that eventually go to Australia and start to create a truly global network. They're going to be the ones that go to sub-Saharan Africa and kind of create or reinvent the uh, global network of exchange. And one of the things that's going on here is one of the big movers and shakers within the Afro-Eurasian zone is going to be these small, highly commercial and highly competitive states of Western Europe. These guys are going to be the ones that will link the separate world zones of the agrarian eras. It's going to be these Western Europeans for a variety of reasons, and spoiler alert, almost none of them are good motivations, um, to go out and to explore. There's always going to be a very, very dark underbelly to what the Europeans want to do. So the impact of the global networks, again, we're going to spend some time on this a little bit later. So again, I, I don't want to spend too much time kind of beating you over the head with this. But the first regions that are going to be transformed by this global system of exchanges is, of course, going to be the Americas and Europe. Because remember, 1492, Columbus goes out and is going to, quote unquote, discover the new world of the Americas. And that's really going to be step one in creating uh, the first part of this growth of global networks. And this exchange is going to bring two things. Um, one of them is really obvious. It's going to bring great commercial wealth. And again, in a couple chapters, when we get into the textbook, you'll you know be refreshed as to you know the wealth of the Aztecs and the Incans and all that, which of course the Europeans are just going to very greedily gobble up. But one of the things that oftentimes is overlooked here with this exchange is, is that there's a new influx of information about everything, about geography, about the natural world, about customs of other societies. The Western Europeans in particular, for a period of time, are going to become obsessed with gathering as much knowledge as they possibly can. And there is going to be just this huge, almost overwhelming influx of new information that for a lot of people is almost going to be kind of troubling. So there's a couple big things here that as you're getting down here in your notes, you want to put a bunch of stars by because they're really some kind of key points that sometimes are easily overlooked, but they definitely shouldn't be. And they're also going to be things that we will reference back to once we get into the textbook and kind of beyond. The first here is that no region on earth was completely unaffected by this first global system. 
even though we'll have in our minds that, you know, the Europeans are reaping all of the benefits and the people of the Americas are kind of getting hosed over, you have to realize that this exchange goes back and forth. It's not one way. You'll see that, yeah, the Americas will kind of get screwed over on the deal, but they will also receive some benefits. I'm not saying that, you know, the good and the bad is anywhere near equal. And the Europeans definitely are getting more of the good stuff, but the Europeans will get some things of, you know, questionable status here. The other big thing is, and again, you want to put a bunch of stars by this, just like it's up on the screen, is the modern world owes its development to the growth of the agrarian era. Again, it's a video game almost. You can't go to the next level until you have mastered the level before. You can't become a city unless you've mastered the village level. You can't become a state if you haven't mastered the city level. You can't become an empire or an imperial state if you're still on the struggle bus anywhere before. And you certainly aren't going to become a global network if you haven't been able to master all of those levels before.